Hey guys, Greg Benz here with an overview of the brand new raw support for Apple's iOS 10 operating system for the iPhone. You can now finally shoot images on your iPhone in RAW and get all the benefits from Lightroom or whatever RAW editor you use when you capture an image with your iPhone. This ultimately means that an Apple iPhone is truly a professional camera. You can do amazing things with it and I want to show you how you can take advantage of that today. Now, in addition to the new operating system, Apple also released the iPhone 7, which has dramatic improvements for the camera, especially in low light. It's more sensitive, has a faster F1.8 aperture in it, as well as some anti-vibration features. So a very nice upgrade, and Verizon was offering a deal that basically made it a free phone for me nearly. Uh, so I went out on day one to get it. Uh, the only snag for me is I needed it in the largest 256 gig model because I do have a lot of media on my phone. Uh, luckily, they had it for me, but there was just one snag, only in rose gold. So I'm now the proud owner of a pink iPhone, but that's all right. Now, in addition to the phone here, um, you also will be getting headphones with an iPhone that have a volume jack. Now, in addition to being headphones for you, this volume jack is the first accessory you'll want with an iPhone. If you're shooting on a tripod or other long exposures where there may be camera shake, you can actually click on the uh, plus or minus volume button to activate a camera with an iPhone. So this is essentially your remote release for your camera, whether or not you use it as headphones. So make sure you grab these and take them with you if you're gonna shoot on a tripod. But let's go ahead and jump into the camera here. And the app I'm gonna show you is called Pro Camera. So let's jump right in and take a photo. Now with the new operating system, you can simply raise to wake the phone. It will bring up the lock screen. If you swipe right, you'll get the default camera app from Apple. But if you swipe left, you get your widgets. And Pro Camera allows you to add a widget. So this is the app that I prefer using. You just simply can click on the Pro Camera icon here. Notice that it shows you sunrise and sunset. So it's just a very nice little widget. Put it right at the top quick, easy access to the camera. So I'm gonna click the very first icon, which will open directly into the camera. And we can simply turn around here, and I can just click anywhere to automatically focus and compose and take a shot. And if we click into our camera roll at the bottom here, notice that every other shot is marked raw. And that is because this app will shoot both RAW and JPEG simultaneously. There's no option to shoot only RAW at this time. I hope that's something they release later but you can see here clearly which of these images are raw. If you're in the default photos app in Apple, uh, in, in iOS, you will not see a distinction between the fo two photos. It'll look like duplicates. So open it within this app if you wanna see that or within Lightroom Mobile. So let's go back into the camera and let's just take a look at what we can truly do with this app. So if I tap anywhere on the screen, it will automatically focus and expose for that area. Just like the camera app you're used to from Apple, but if I now uh, click and drag from here, I can separate the focus from the exposure. So I could focus for some of these darker spots of the image. I could then focus for the foreground if I want. Totally independent control, very nice. And if I wanna quickly get back to locking them together, click anywhere outside of the two and you'll simply realign both of them. Or let's go ahead and we'll focus on the bridge here and let's expose a little bit over here. And what you can do is simply click and hold on one of these reticles to lock it in. And what I like to do is simply take the exposure control and just move it off the edge here. Every time you move it, it will try and recapture the exposure, but now that it's locked and out of the way, we have our exposure essentially locked in and I can simply click on the ISO option here to choose whatever ISO I want for the image, as well as the shutter speed and dial that in. Now watch on the left-hand side of the screen, there's a histogram and as I move it very dark, you can see the, the bottom of that, which is the left edge of a histogram if I was shooting vertically, is red. So the shadows are blown here. And as I make it lighter, eventually the highlights start to get to blown. And occasionally the histogram does not mark in red, but you can see clearly that the highlights are blown there from just the histogram. So it's a very usable histogram. I really like it. So I like to expose for the highlights. So let's simply get right around here. I think that's gonna be a really nice setup. Let's go ahead and take that and we'll jump over to Lightroom later to take a look at that image and compare the RAW and the JPEG. But just a couple of other quick things. Simply click into our camera roll here and we can open up one of these images and if we want to, this little sharing icon at the bottom, you notice 
one of the options I have looks like the Adobe Creative Cloud icon, and if I click on that, then I will get an option to enter a file name as well as choose an action, which can be to send to Photoshop, which is just pure magic. It will actually open the photo in Photoshop on your computer when it's syncing and let you start editing immediately in Photoshop. So it's almost like shooting tethered. Or you can save to Creative Cloud, which will put it up in your shared files in Creative Cloud. There is not currently an option to open this up directly in Lightroom. Perhaps that'll come in the future, but it's very easy to simply move these to the Lightroom mobile app on your phone to sync wirelessly, or just simply plug your phone in at home and import just like a memory card into Lightroom. So let's jump back into the camera portion here. And a couple other things. You'll notice this up-down arrow. That allows you to choose the different shooting modes, which includes a low light mode. Does not seem to be fully supported yet for the iPhone 7. I can't get it to do some of the um, operations that it's supposed to do on the iPhone 6, but it does include a very neat low light mode that let you shoot multiple images and combine them into one long exposure. So you can almost like putting a neutral density filter right onto your iPhone. Very neat little feature. Uh, has selfie and video options as well as HDR as an add-on. Uh, next, you've got the uh, common shutter button in the middle, but next to it you see this little self-timer. Clicking on that will activate a self-timer, or in the menu system we can choose the anti-shake mode, and that puts it on anti-shake, which will simply fire an image as soon as the camera is stable. So if I'm moving around, you'll see it's showing that there's movement. When I stop, it takes a picture. So it's a really nice way to shoot handheld and ensure you get a nice stable photo. Um, and then up top here are the rest of the menu options. There is a tilt meter, which as you level the camera should turn green. And I've found that it's not super accurate. I don't love it. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. Right now, either I don't, yeah, I'm just not getting it level. So I don't use it too much. Um, I find it's a little hit or miss. Uh, perhaps it'll get better in the future. Uh, aspect ratio lets you crop your image. A standard just simply chooses the amount of information you would see on the screen. So here you can get to a very simple on-screen display if you want. So I just generally leave that at standard. Uh, there are the various grids. You see right now I have not rule of thirds, but actually the golden ratio, which is the way that I like to compose. But if you click through grids, you can see different options. So here's just a very detailed grid, a rule of thirds grid, or the one that I like with the golden ratio. Um, so very useful for composing. There's the option to turn the histogram on, off, or small or large. So some very nice options there. In fact, um, that's probably the way most people would want to see it. Doesn't really obscure your ability to shoot. Very, very helpful to have a real histogram. You notice as I move and recompose, we're getting you know, changes in that histogram. So it's a very nice live histogram. Uh, there's an option to change your white balance, which you can see right here which conveniently shows you, you know, here's what a sunny day would be, here's cloudy, here's shade. Uh, I just generally leave it on automatic white balance. Since I'm shooting in RAW, it's easy to change it later, so I just prefer to turn that off, but it's a great feature. Uh, there is the anti-shake feature that I showed you, but one neat little thing, if you hold down on the anti-shake, you can actually choose how sensitive it is to your motion. So, very customizable feature. There is rapid fire, of course, you want to take multiple images quickly. Uh, and then the ability to turn on and off the manual control. So we can simply go to various different shooting modes. So I like the full manual control with this. And then in addition to all these quick options here, uh, you can also click to choose your, you know, you want RAW, JPEG, et cetera, and the settings button, which has a plethora of additional options. I'm not gonna go through all of them here. I will put all the settings I use on my blog and with this video so you can go through and set it up to get exactly the kind of results that I've got. But it's a, just an incredible app. Highly recommend Pro Camera. So let's change gears. The first part of this video is all about showing how the new iPhone and iOS can capture RAW, as well as how you can use the Pro Camera app to set manual settings such as ISO and shutter speed on your iPhone to capture images just like you might with a digital SLR. It's incredibly powerful. I know that went pretty quick, so you may wanna replay that. Definitely take a look at my blog where I write down in detail all the different settings that I used to get you up and running. For this next part of the video, we're gonna compare the JPEG and the RAW with an eye towards understanding what the differences are between these, as well as how much of an advantage the RAW can offer us versus a JPEG coming off of an iPhone. So I've imported all my images onto Lightroom on my laptop here. 
I have just one image here in both JPEG, which is marked in red here, as well as the raw, which is a .dng file. That's the Adobe standard for raw file. So as I flip between these, you're gonna see the JPEG and the raw up top here. Now notice that one of these uh, file numbers is not exactly the same as the other. So when this app is recording both JPEG and RAW, which is the only way it currently records RAW, the numbers are sequential. So even though this is the exact same image, you can see all the settings are the same, the framing is exactly the same, the way that it gets saved, it does change the file number between them, but this is the exact same image. And I've reset all the settings on here to the default zero. So there's absolutely no difference in how these two are processed. So just initially looking at the JPEG here, we can see that it's a very high contrast image. It's a very bright day outside and the highlights in the sky are completely blown as well as part of the buildings. And at the same time, the shadow detail is essentially gone in a number of the parts of the underside of this bridge. If we switch over to the DNG file, the raw file, we can see there's more detail in the buildings as well as in the shadow areas here. Now, another way of looking at that, if we go back to the, the JPEG again, would be simply to turn on the shadow warnings and the highlight warnings. These are the, the areas that are clipped. And so let's just click to turn these on. And so now everything in blue is essentially a clip shadow and everything in red is a clipped highlight. And if we look at the JPEG here, versus the raw, we can see a dramatic difference. None of the shadows are clipped in the raw and the amount of red clipped highlights has decreased dramatically. So JPEG and raw, or let's turn these off and just look at the overall differences again from JPEG to raw. Now, as I look through here, a couple things stand out. Aside from the blown highlights and shadows, I do think that the JPEG in some ways is more attractive. If we look at this part of the image down here, the, the mid-tones of the image and the water in the buildings here from before JPEG to the raw, because of the greater contrast in the JPEG, it does look a little bit nicer and there's a little bit more color. So it kind of begs the question, how can you process the raw to look like the JPEG? Well, this is very unscientific and I only spent about 10 minutes doing it, but I have this middle yellow image here, which is the same raw image, but I have adjusted it. And the settings that I've used on it are designed to make this raw look as close as I can to the JPEG. So here's the JPEG and here's the processed raw. And you can see it's definitely not the same. There are some color shifts. There are some contrast shifts and there's some differences in the detail in the middle part of the bridge as well. So here's the raw to the processed, uh, sorry, the JPEG to the processed raw. So they are as close as I can get them um, the algorithm used by Apple to produce the JPEG is not the same as Adobe's adjustments that I'm using here or that you would have in Camera Raw if you were doing this in Photoshop. So it will never be exactly the same, but this is pretty close. And I think it's pretty instructive if we look at what changes I had to make to get here. I had to significantly bump up the highlights as well as the whites. And that is reflective of all that clipping you see as well as an increase in contrast on the flip side, I had to dramatically reduce the shadows. So again, a loss of detail in the shadows and an increase in contrast by making the shadows darker and the highlights brighter. Additionally, there is some level of what is similar to clarity applied to this. There's a little bit of a crispy texture to the image that gives it a little bit more appearance of sharpness and clarity. So I had to bump that up a decent amount as well as more color with the vibrance. One other thing you'll notice if you look, especially in these parts of the building that are somewhat neutral from the JPEG to the raw, there's a bit of a color shift and I did not try to correct that, but because the, uh, the color balance may not be baked in the raw quite the same, the, the color balance is also a little bit different. So there's some pretty significant differences out of the box. Some of them are related to the limits of the file. Many of them are also related to the fact that JPEG is designed to be a finished file. It has a lot of assumptions baked into it. When you create a JPEG, you wouldn't want to have, and let me go back to just the unprocessed files. When you take the raw file and convert it to a JPEG, you wouldn't want to bake in all this low contrast. You actually want to make your JPEG look something a little bit punchier and a little more finished, and that's why it's been processed this way. Now, this is not the image I want, but it's perhaps a little bit more shareable right out of the box than a raw. So we do have to do a little bit of work with a raw file, or we should. 
Now let's take a look at what's possible in terms of recovering some of this detail. So I'm simply going to bring down the highlights while holding down the Option or the Alt key so I can see what's blown and I'm going to bring back the highlights until I've brought them in range. So we've gone from the original before to after. Now note especially up here in the details of this is a part of the bridge up above the before and after we brought back quite a bit of detail there's color in that sky and in fact one of the best tests of what data exists in your image is to take the exposure slider and slide it left and right if we bring this down we can see a dramatic recovery of details some of these little clouds in the distance are still blown those are truly blown highlights and there's not really any color in this part of the sky so that's essentially blown it's not fully clipped but it should be blue and it's not whereas up here we have substantial recovery of the detail now over here this is also clipped it's more a little bit cloudy in this area and that threw it fully out of range but you can see that there's quite a bit of detail that we can get back versus the untouched image where this is all blown let's also look at the shadows overall um, by simply comparing these two so here's the jpeg and here's our slightly recovered raw if we were to take these settings and bring them over to our JPEG. So now we've matched them. There is a little bit of recovery in the underside of this bridge. So areas that are not blown out can be brought a little bit more in range, but notice the white is just completely white. There's absolutely nothing there versus in the raw file. There's actually the beginnings of blue. And let's just bring this back to see things a little bit more comparable. So I'm gonna bring back more than I need to here, but I'm gonna copy these exact settings to the JPEG and notice there is just absolutely nothing to bring back. The sky is just totally gone here on the JPEG. And notice this part of the sky by the buildings. These buildings have no detail versus in the raw. There's still a lot of areas that are blown, but there's a lot more there. So clearly we have a much better highlight detail in our files in the raw than we do in the JPEG. So let's again, let's match these up and let's maybe take a look at the shadow detail. So. One easy way to do that would be to bump up the shadows. I'm just simply going to bring up the exposure. I'm gonna bring it up enough so we can make a comparison, but I don't wanna go crazy. I've probably already lightened it more than I would in a finished image. So one thing to note about this comparison is it's a little unnaturally bright and we're gonna see more noise than we would see in a finished image because we're essentially pushing things further and highlighting some of the weaknesses. So with that same adjustment, we still just really don't have comparable detail between the raw and the JPEG. So what if we push this even further to try and bring this out? So once we get to the point where, well, let's try and bring back a little bit of shadow detail. So we can recover some detail here in the JPEG and I'm gonna copy these settings over to our raw. And it's essentially just too much for the raw. So I'm gonna, at this point, deviate a bit and bring down the raw to something that looks a little bit more like where we'd want it. And again, it still doesn't have all the contrast, but I think it's enough to make some, some quick comparisons here. In fact, let's even bring our shadows down a bit. See if we can't bring out a little bit more of the detail here. So somewhat comparable, not really quite. Let's, I'm gonna try and get these as close as I can. So again, you can see it's not a fair comparison because we're, we're dealing with different animals. You have to process the JPEG differently than the raw, but it's enough to understand some of the differences. And I think one thing you'll be surprised to see when we zoom in here is look at the detail in this JPEG. A couple things to notice. There isn't a lot of noise. In fact, it's blotchy. There's these areas of just almost continuous tone. It looks like camouflage on a military vehicle in this part. And these green areas are kind of chunky. And this is also kind of chunky. So there is heavy, heavy noise reduction being applied to this JPEG in the shadows. I didn't do that in Lightroom. That was done in the camera. That's baked into the file. There's nothing to recover. Now let's look over at our raw file. And again, it's lower contrast and we can keep working on it to bring out more contrast if we want to in this area. All that details there. But the first thing to notice is look at the JPEG to the raw. And you can see that there's just much more tonal detail. Things are much more consistent. We don't get that blotchiness. But one thing we do get is a ton of color noise. Look at all this color noise. It looks pretty bad actually. In fact, when I look at this, I would rather live with the loss of detail and the smooth tones here than the color noise in this raw. 
but again, that's because the JPEG has been cooked with noise reduction, so we need to make some adjustments to our RAW. And the first thing we want to do is slide up the color noise reduction. One nice thing about color noise reduction in Lightroom is you can really push it all the way to the maximum. So look at the before, especially up here, look at that, all those blotchy different colors. And as we bring this up, they effectively, oh, let's uh, grab the right slider here, grab the color noise reduction and bring that up. And notice that that color noise is really essentially gone. So I would crank up the color noise a lot when processing shadow detail out of an iPhone in a raw image. In fact, 100% is not at all unreasonable. But we can still go further. The luminance noise is still here. If we look at the JPEG, which is blotchy, but doesn't have any obvious grain versus the raw, there is obvious grain here. So let's crank up this luminance noise reduction. Let's try 50%. I think that looks a lot better. Let's even go to 75%, still better. If we go all the way up to 100, it's probably not really improving things. So I would bring it back a bit. And notice some areas of detail, such as here, if we look at with 63, versus turning it off. So we are losing a little bit of detail, but not too much. So cranking up the noise reduction considerably more than I typically would with a digital SLR is appropriate when processing this. So let's look at the overall enhancement we made. Here was the original shadow detail, and now with the color and luminous noise reduction, it looks much better versus the JPEG, which is really blotchy and again, looks a bit like camouflage, it's unrealistic. So, and again, recognizing that we wouldn't lighten these shadows quite this much because there's so much highlight detail in the overall photo, this probably would be an unrealistic adjustment to make, but it does bring back much more detail. So there's a lot more to play with, but you do have to work a little bit harder to get that detail out. So I hope you found that to be a helpful overview of the comparison between these, and clearly you can see that the raw files on an iPhone definitely provide a lot of data you don't get in the JPEG. The highlights are much, much better. The shadows have a lot more usable data that you have to work a little bit harder to bring it out. And you have the ability to make all sorts of non-destructive edits in a program like Lightroom to really push these files further. So I would definitely encourage you to use raw when shooting with an iPhone. If you're shooting images you really care about, it adds a tremendous amount of quality to your images and really takes things to a much more professional level. So I hope you've enjoyed that tutorial. Uh, please feel free to leave your feedback in the comments if you wanna see more videos like this or if you have any other questions. And definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel and my free newsletter to get more free photography tips and tutorials like this one. Thank you.